I am. Two words that spoke volumes. Two words that echoed the strains of Old Testament narratives, angering Jesus' opponents, but breathing life into his disciples. Seven bold, remarkable statements in the Gospel of John begin with these exact words, giving us profound insight into Jesus' identity and showing us how to truly find ours. Our cries of, I am empty, are met with, I am the bread of life. Our pleas of, I am lost, are countered with, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Two simple words addressing every one of our fears, doubts, and pain. I am. Well, Summit Church, we have an amazing, exciting week that is coming up. We are hosting services, uh, many of them, and some on our college campuses. And of course, next week, we are expecting, by God's grace, uh, for the places all of our campus to be packed out. So if you have not already, let me join our campus pastors and our teams and uh, encourage you. I want to hope, um, I want to pray that you will invite somebody to come with you this coming weekend. Nobody, nobody in the Summit Church should come alone next weekend. This is the one time a year that people are most open to receiving an invitation to come with you to church. So use that, use that opportunity to bring them, bring them here. And to that end, let me call you to participate in our Easter prayer focus that we're going to be doing all week long during Passion Week, starting tomorrow morning. Uh, kicks off March 25th in the morning with a church-wide day of fasting, one day of fasting. And then each day from there through Sunday, April 7th, we're going to journey together um, to the cross and then beyond the empty tomb um, uh, for 14 days by praying through the last words that Jesus spoke on the way to the cross and then um, after he had resurrected from the dead. Those words reveal not just Jesus's heart for us, but his heart for the world. And so it's a great way to focus your prayers. You're gonna get a prompt um, to guide you each day if you just go to our Summit Church app. In fact, you use this app, this uh, Summit Church app. There's a little tab on there. It says Daily Revival. If not, you should use this. It's the, the best way for information and for us to really just help guide you day by day about how to walk, uh, grow in your walk with the Lord. It's um, so helpful. Um, so as always, you can always learn more about this. Um, any info on our Easter services and the differences in the times and stuff, uh, that'll be taking place place. That is on our app. Um, that's the best way. Or you can go to our website, summitchurch.com slash Easter. Okay. All right. John chapter 10. If you got your Bibles this morning, John 10, you can put that pick up here. Um, my wife used to have a picture of uh, famous doors in our house. Um, do you recognize this door here? Recognize this one? This is the entry door to one of the most famous residences in the world, 10 Downing Street, the home of the British Prime Minister, uh, Benjamin Disraeli, Winston Churchill, Margaret Thatcher, Tony Blair, they've all lived behind that door. This particular door was designed in 1772. It was made of thick, beautiful black oak with these big, you know, Georgian panels, uh, except, except what you're looking at in this picture is no longer that original 1772 door um, uh, because, because in 1991, an IRA pipe bomb that was detonated a few hundred yards down the street um, there on Downing Street didn't actually damage this residence, but it was close enough that it convinced the British government to replace the historic wooden door with a bulletproof replica. So what you're looking at in this picture looks like beautiful English black oak, but it's actually blast proof steel. And that little gold letter box that used to be able to drop off a nice little love note for the prime minister, uh, that didn't work anymore. They don't want people to be able to slide in little, little pipe bombs or anything. And so uh, that's just a plate that goes to nowhere. Uh, and if you look closely at this, you'll, you will see there's no longer a keyhole in that door. Um, uh, and that little doorknob that you see right there in the middle, it doesn't turn. The door can now only be open from the inside. And the security guard who stands just inside that door, you can't see him, but right on the other side of that door, opens that door only to those that the prime minister wants to let in. We are looking at the I am statements of Jesus. Seven times in the Gospel of John, where Jesus takes the loftiest name of God in the Old Testament, I am Yahweh, and he claims it for himself. And then he attaches to that name one of our greatest areas of brokenness or need. And so today we come to the third of those I am statements, John chapter 10, verse nine. 
I am the door. If anybody enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Doors or gates are a big deal in scripture. You've probably never done a study of doors in the Bible, but you might consider it. In Genesis, for example, Genesis tells us that after Adam and Eve had sinned, angels were placed at the entry gate, the door, to the Garden of Eden with flaming swords in their hands that pointed every direction to bar re-entry into the Garden of Eden. By the way, I've always thought the ultimate Indiana Jones movie would be for him to find that gate with those angels and the Garden of Eden behind it. That's way better than the Crystal Skull or the Dial of Destiny or any of the dumb stuff they did after the Lost Ark and the Holy Grail. But that's just my opinion, okay? But you had a door there at the beginning, a door that was guarded by angels. Then there's the door to Noah's Ark. The book of Genesis says that the ark that God had Noah build to save himself and his family and a selection of the animals only had one door. And that after Noah's family and all the animals had gone through that one door safely, that God himself shut it. One of the most significant features of the temple's design was the singularity of the doors. The temple was not built like our church facilities with multiple entry and exit points. There was no fire codes to deal with back then. There weren't multiple points of egress and regress. There was just one gate, one gate through which people could enter the tabernacle courtyard. And that was what one way was covered by a really thick curtain. And the first thing you encountered upon entering the temple was the bronze altar on which sacrifices for sin were offered. The message, there's one way God was saying to get to me, and it's through this altar right here. Then there was the door into the Holy of Holies itself where the Ark of the Covenant was, which was also covered by a thick curtain of blue and purple and scarlet. Only the high priest could pass through that door and only one time a year on the day of atonement when he sprinkled the blood of a sacrificed lamb on the mercy seat that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. If anybody else ever tried to enter that area by any other way, for any other reason, at any other time, they were struck dead on the spot. Very interestingly, by the way, in front of the entry to the Holy of Holies were carvings of angels standing guard and then another two carved angels on top of the mercy seat there on top of the Ark of the Covenant, symbolic of those angels with the flaming swords that guarded the entry back into the Garden of Eden. So all that to say, doors were a big deal in the Old Testament, which makes Jesus's claim here all the more significant. Let's read the conversation in John 10 where Jesus makes this claim, okay? The context for this conversation, by the way, in case you forgot from last weekend, is that Jesus has just forgiven a woman caught in adultery and he's just given sight to a blind man. The Pharisees had responded very negatively to those two miracles. They resented Jesus's power on the one hand and they showed an utter callousness for the forgiven woman and the healed man on the other. So in these stories, you are going to see Jesus is setting up a contrast between his heart for people and the Pharisees' heart for people, or I should say lack of heart for people. And so Jesus says, verse one, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, well, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them with an eye roll, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anybody enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. In those days, there were two kinds of sheepfolds. There were city sheepfolds and there were country sheepfolds. And Jesus draws on the imagery of both of them here to make his point and kind of weaves back and forth between the two of them. And so, so, so I'm gonna kind of untangle it for you. City sheepfolds were big and communal. At night, shepherds would bring their flocks into one big communal sheep pen where uh, 
paid sentry would stand guard while the shepherd went out with his buddies or got a good night's sleep somewhere or whatever. As many as five or six flocks at a time were kept together in the one pen. If you ever go to Israel one day, you can see the ruins of some of these large sheep pens. When the morning, the shepherd would come by to pick up his flock. And of course you ask, well, how would he separate out his sheep from the others since they're all mixed together? Great question. You may not know this, but sheep have remarkably discerning hearing. They have notoriously bad eyesight, yes, and they're pretty stupid as far as animals go, but they have really good hearing. And so when the shepherd would call out to his sheep, only his sheep responded and the rest all stay put. Thieves would sometimes try to steal sheep by dressing up like the shepherd and impersonating him. And here was the thing, they could usually fool the guard. They'd wear a hood, they identify themselves by the shepherd's name. The real problem was fooling the sheep. The sheep would recognize the difference between the voice of the stranger and the voice of the true shepherd. That's what Jesus is talking about in verses four and five. My sheep recognize my voice. They follow me and they will not respond to the voice of an imposter. So those, those are the city sheepfolds. But then there were also country sheepfolds. And they look more like this. You got sort of a, a, an ad hoc pen out in the countryside that somebody would throw up. Anybody could use that, that, that pen. Had, you know, didn't have high walls, had low walls. But those pens usually had no door, which meant that the shepherd would sleep right there in that little gap. The shepherd was the door. He would keep thieves or wild animals from coming in. Sometimes thieves would try to sneak over the walls while the shepherd slept so that they could get at the sheep. Getting over the wall was pretty easy. It was getting the sheep out that was the problem. Sheep are heavy. It was nigh unto impossible to get their fat rear ends over that wall without the sheep making a ton of noise. You know, like, oh, me, you bad man, or whatever they would say, okay? <laughs> Sorry, I'm still a dad. That's a dad joke. But that's what Jesus is referring to in verse one when he says that one who does not enter by the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man's a thief and a robber. Jesus was saying these Pharisees, they're like the thieves who were trying to climb over the walls and steal the sheep. They're the ones who are imitating the voice of the shepherd, but those with ears to hear and those with eyes to see, like this forgiven woman and this blind man, they recognize that I'm the true shepherd and they follow me. They recognize that I'm the only way back into God's pasture. I'm the door, I'm the door. I'm the one door back into the presence of God. So here's what we see in all that. We see first, number one, we see the way of salvation. Jesus is the door. He is the one gateway back into the presence of God, just like there was one entry point into Noah's ark through which Noah and his family could enter the shelter of the ark and be saved. And just like there was one way to safely enter the temple courtyard, and that was to come by the way of the altar. And just like there was one way, one, one entry way into the Holy of Holies, one time a year on the day of atonement with the blood of a sacrifice in your hand, Jesus is the one door into the presence and the pasture lands of God. In fact, when you start to see all the imagery around the death and resurrection of Jesus, it's pretty overwhelming. When Jesus died, the curtain that guarded the door into the Holy of Holies was ripped in two from the top to the bottom. That was symbolic of the fact that Jesus' torn body was now the entryway back into the presence of God. His blood was sprinkled on the heavenly mercy seat so that, so that we could come back into God's presence. Y'all remember how I told you that when Adam and Eve were driven out of the presence of God at the Garden of Eden, that God had put angels with flaming swords in front of the garden to bar their re-entry? And images, I told you, of those same angels were put over the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, one on each side, and they were also put there in front of the Holy of Holies, recreating this barring into the Garden of Eden. Remember that? A little detail that the Apostle John includes about the resurrection that most people read right over is that when Mary first got to the tomb on resurrection morning, it says she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the foot. Two angels, one at the head, one at the foot. Do you see what's being recreated? Jesus' resurrected body is the new mercy seat. He had taken the flaming sword of God's judgment in our place, and now he's the door through which we can re-enter the garden of God's presence and come boldly to the throne of grace with any need we have to, for help any time that we need it. Now, y'all, I know it's popular today. I know it's popular today to say that God is like a mountain. There are many ways to the top. They all head in the same direction. I got my way, you got your way. 
Different religions may call God by different names. They have slightly different rules. But they all basically teach the same thing and they're headed to the same place. But do you see how out of sync that is with what the Bible teaches from cover to cover? There is always only one door and God is in charge of it. And the most terrible judgments, death itself, await those who attempt to enter by any other way. Which leads me to the second thing we see in Jesus' claim to be the door. Number two, we see a claim to exclusivity. A claim to exclusivity. Jesus said, I am the door, not a door. I am the door. I am the one. I am the one door to Noah's Ark. I am the one door into the Holy of Holies. And maybe that feels mean or arrogant or judgmental to you for me to say that. But friends, it's not mean or arrogant or judgmental to say that if it's true. I'm not in charge of the door. God is. I haven't told this story in a while, but it's a classic. Years ago, before I was married, I was taking a, a flight from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where I was serving at the time as a youth pastor, back to Greensboro, North Carolina, which was the closest airport to my house. It was a red-eye flight, you know, late at night. There were only three of us in the gate area when I got to the gate. It was like 11.30 at night or something like that. One of the people in the gate area was an elderly man who looked at least 80 years old, or maybe 180, I really couldn't tell. But bottom line, he didn't seem long for the earth. One foot in the grave, one foot on a banana peel at any moment, you know, you just didn't know what was gonna happen. The other... The other was a beautiful young woman in her early 20s. Now, at the time, y'all, I was young and single, long before I met Veronica, okay? So I prayed about where God wanted me to sit. And it felt like ice cream spinach. You know, I'm gonna be honest with you. And I, I mysteriously found my feet leading me to sit next to the young woman. I found out she was from Chile down in South America. And turned out she was on her way back to Cambridge, Massachusetts and Harvard University. But she was stopping off to see some friends in Greensboro first. Well, I had just graduated from Campbell University, known around the world as the Harvard of the Sand Hills. So I felt, I felt right there we had a connection, okay? Her name, her name was Berta, okay? Not Bertha, but with a, with a Chilean flair, Berta. We started talking about what we were doing with our lives and I told her how Jesus had changed my life and how I wanted to go into law, but he redirected me into kind of where I was headed now. And, and I wanted to spend the rest of my life telling other people about Jesus. My motives at this point were at least partially right. Um, she was so full of questions, y'all. I mean, asking me how I arrived at this certainty, how it changed my life, uh, just all kinds of questions. Then at some point in the conversation, she just looked at me and she said, you know, she said at Harvard, I'm around some of the most driven, intelligent men in the world, but I don't think I've ever heard any of them speak with such conviction and clarity and winsomeness about anything. And I find that deeply attractive. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is awesome. She's gonna get saved, we're gonna get married. This is gonna be an awesome story that I get to share at conferences about how we met. We sat next to each other on the plane and we kept talking about Jesus and our lives for basically the entire journey. As we began our descent into the Greensboro airport, I thought I'd better, uh, thought I'd better close the deal for Jesus. And, uh, and I said, <laughs> I, said, uh, I, said, I said, well, would you, would you like to receive Jesus as your savior, Bertha? And then to my surprise, honestly, it surprised me. She said, no. She said, no, you know, that kind of stuff has just never really worked for me. She said, I really am so happy that you have found your peace in Jesus, but I relate to my God in a totally different way. So I said, I said, Berta, I don't, I don't think you understand, okay? <laughs> you see, Jesus said in John 10, John 14, 6, showed her some of these verses that he was not a way to God, a door, but he was the way, the door. He's the only way of salvation. She said, yeah, but it just doesn't, it doesn't fit me. We all have our own way to God and my way is good for me and your way is good for you. And I kept saying, but Bertha, look at what he said. And she said, surely you're not saying to me that there's only one way to come to God. Surely you're not saying that your way is the only way. And I affirmed that I was, that was indeed exactly what I was saying, except it was not me saying it, it was Jesus saying it. She looked at me 
And she said, that has to be the most arrogant, closed-minded thing I've ever heard anybody say. I cannot believe anybody today in a modern day, I cannot believe anybody with any education at all would be so bigoted as to think that there's only one way to God. And then she's kind of sat back and folded her hands. I, I, I sat there honestly a little dumbfounded, slowly unwinding the wedding plans, by the way. <laughs> but I was trying to figure out what to say. And then the pilot came on the little intercom and he announced our final descent into Greensboro and I had an idea. But I said, I said, I sure am glad the pilot of this airplane does not look at the airport the same way you do truth. She said, what do you mean? I said, I just say he comes on the PA right now and announces, you know, I am sick of that arrogant little control tower. <laughs> Always telling me where and how I gotta land this 737. That just doesn't work for me, honestly, anymore. I'm an open-minded pilot, so today I'm gonna attempt to land this aircraft upside down on the interstate or nose tip first on the tip of the Bank of America building. That's, that's my way of landing this plane. She said, that's not a fair comparison. I said, yes, it is, and that's Campbell One, Harvard Zero, by the way, in case you're keeping score, all right? Now, I'll be honest. As the words were coming out of my mouth, I knew, I knew that I was not doing what Peter commanded us to do in 1 Peter 3.15, to answer those who object to what we say with gentleness and respect. <laughs> and honestly, all I hope that my brashness did not create further obstacles in Berta's heart to receiving the gospel. But honestly, y'all, I still stand by that comparison. And today I'm proud to announce that she's part of our summit in Espanol campus. I am just kidding. Would that not be awesome? No, no, yeah, she's not. Not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. But here's the point, here's the point. Here's the point. It is not mean or arrogant to say that Jesus is the only door if he says he's the only door. If he's God, if he is the I am, then he gets to make the rules about salvation. It's his door. It's always been his door. It's his runway of salvation. In fact, I think it's arrogant for you to say that you think you can enter God's presence any old way you choose. That would make you the author of salvation, but he's the author of salvation. He's the I am. And he's the, the reason the I am is significant because you are not. If you were the I am, then he would need to be the I am, but because you're not, he is. Saying you can get to God any old way you choose makes you, Jesus says, not an open-minded person. It makes you an attempted thief and robber. The wise person recognizes the voice of the shepherd calling out the one way of salvation and humbly follows him. Which leads me to number three. We, Jesus gives us in this an insight into conversion. Y'all, as if Jesus were not being offensive enough. You ever notice about Jesus when he starts being offensive and people start pointing that out? He just piles it on. He's like, oh yeah, you ain't heard nothing yet. Here he goes. He's like, furthermore, in order for you to recognize the voice of the true shepherd, God has to give you ears to hear. Look at verse four. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. A stranger they will not follow. They will flee from, the vo from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. Doesn't that raise the question? Why is it that some people recognize the voice of Jesus and others do not? Why did the woman caught in adultery and why did the man born blind, why did they believe Jesus was who he says he was? And the Pharisees do not believe that? I mean, think about it. Who was more theologically trained? The Pharisees or the adulterous woman and the blind man? Who was smarter? Who was more morally upright? In all those cases, it was the Pharisees, and yet they didn't recognize the voice of Jesus. Where do ears to hear come from? This is one of the most offensive parts of the gospel. God has to give you ears to hear it. This was the meaning, by the way, of the healing of the man, uh, uh, healing of the man born blind. That man didn't have astigmatism. He didn't need a pair of glasses. He was blind. God and God alone gives spiritual sight. The man healed of blindness even recognized that. He told him in John chapter nine, he said, I didn't heal myself of blindness. Only God could do that. The only thing I know is once I was blind and now I see. This was a direct insult to the Pharisees who thought that their superior morality and their superior intellect would give them the edge in understanding who God was. And Jesus says, nope, 
To discern spiritual truth requires a spiritual gift, a gift that only comes from God. You're too sinful and too blind for your intellect to figure things out. You need supernatural illumination. You need grace. That's how he said it. Here's how he said it in John 6, 44. Nobody can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. You know what that means, friend? It means if you're attracted to Jesus, it's because the father drew you. Nobody, no one comes to the father and Jesus unless the father draws him. Paul would say it this way in 1 Corinthians 12, three, nobody can even say that Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Meaning if there is some heart level recognition in you that Jesus is Lord, if there is a desire to be near him, to follow after him, that can only come from the spirit of God. When Peter recognized Jesus as the Messiah, right? You know, you are the Christ. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ. Jesus didn't say, way to use your intellect, Peter. Your logic is flawless. Instead, he said, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. In other words, your flesh, your brain didn't figure that out, Peter. Only my father in heaven reveals that. Now, some of you say, well, what does that take away my freedom of choice? No, it's still yours to choose. The analogy I always use is this. Imagine, imagine there's a man who is genuinely insane. He thinks he's Spider-Man. He's standing on top of a 30-story building downtown Raleigh somewhere. You approach this man and you say, don't jump. Don't jump. You, you, listen, you don't have web shooters in your wrist. You're going to fall to the ground and die. You're not going to swing through the city and, and stop crime. You, you, you're going to die. But the man genuinely believes he's Spider-Man. What is he going to choose to do every single time you give him that choice? Every time. He's going to jump. Now, say that you, same scenario, you had the ability somehow to restore his sanity to him. Maybe there was like a serum that you could come up behind him with and you could inject it into his arm and his right mind would suddenly be restored to him. Now, now you offer him that same choice. Hey man, you can jump and die or you can walk back down here with me to safety. Now what's he going to choose every single time? He's going to choose every single time to come with you down to safety. In both moments, the choice is his. He chooses freely. The difference is that the first choice to jump comes out of an insane mind. In the other, it comes from a sane mind. The choice is always yours, but spiritual sight, spiritual sanity belongs to God. Well, then you say, well, why didn't God give to this kind of spiritual sight to everybody? And admittedly, there is some mystery here because listen, listen, the Bible always puts the blame on resisting the voice of the Holy Spirit, always puts that on us, never puts it on God's sovereign will, never. For example, Matthew 23, 37, Jesus looks out of, over Jerusalem after they've rejected him and he laments, watch this, watch, pay very close attention to the words. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh, the city that kills the prophets that are sent to it. How often? I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing, not, yeah, I wasn't willing. It wasn't in my sovereign will. You weren't elect, you weren't predestined. No, I wanted to, I tried to, but you resisted it. You weren't willing. I was willing, you weren't. I know you try to think about that too much. If your head feels like it's about to explode. We can only come to Jesus if the Father draws us. We only recognize his voice if the Father gives us ears to hear. But if we don't recognize his voice, the resistance is not in in him, it's in us. And you start thinking about that, you say, well, how can both of those things be fully true? Good question, I don't know. At this point, I will only pass on to you the wise words of my father, who did not go to seminary, who said to me when I first came home from Bible college with my head full of first year theological knowledge, had all these questions about God's sovereignty and I laid out all these deep truths to dad and I'm quoting dead guys from the 15th, 16th, you know, fourth centuries. And I'm like, dad, I just don't understand how all these things work together. And he said, son, for 2000 years, people a lot smarter than you have been trying to figure that out and they haven't done it yet. I doubt that you're gonna be the one <laughs> who figures it all out. So why don't you just do what the apostles did in the book of Acts, preach Jesus. And so that's what I've been doing ever since. Y'all, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things I don't understand. 
and the mysteries of God's providence are high on that list, but there are some things I do understand. And I do understand that Jesus said that he is the only door of salvation. So I hold these two, 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 two things in tension whenever I preach. On the one hand, only Jesus gives spiritual sight. And on the other hand, if you haven't come to Jesus, that's on you, not on him. He invites whosoever will to come, which means you can come today if you choose. The choice is yours. That means, y'all, listen, I pray hard to him. Before I get up here, Jesus, only you can give spiritual sight. The reason there's boiler rooms full, filled with people at every service is because only Jesus gives spiritual sight. So I pray to him hard before I get up here. And then I preach and plead hard to you. And I say, look to Jesus and be saved. Whosoever will may come, the choice is up to you. And what I can say to you here is if you're feeling drawn, if you're feeling something in your heart saying, yes, this is for you, that's the voice of Jesus. But you got to choose. The choice is yours on whether you enter that door or not. Number four, in Jesus' claim to be the door, we have a promise of protection. A promise of protection. Again, verse nine, I am the door, Jesus says. If anybody enters by me, he will be saved. He'll go in and out and find pasture. Y'all listen, the life of a sheep is dangerous. Not only are there thieves who want to steal and kill them, wild animals who want to devour them. Jesus said, like the good shepherd in the country sheepfold, I lay my body down in that doorway between you and all danger. Nothing gets into this pen without my permission. I'm not going to spend long on this one since we're going to get more into it in the I am the good shepherd message we'll do in a few weeks. But do you know how much comfort it would bring to you if you lived every day with the assurance that nothing comes through that pen door into your life without his permission? Nothing. At the door of that, that sheep pen, which I don't have a picture of, anymore, it lays your good shepherd, your almighty shepherd. He says, nothing comes through here. Nothing that I don't let. Psalm 84, 11, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing does he withhold. That means, listen, if he withholds it, it isn't really good. And if he allows it, he plans to use it for good. When I say that Jesus gives us a promise of protection and that no good thing will he withhold, I don't mean God promises you a life of ease. Follow him and you'll always get the job. You'll always receive the healing. The relationship will always work out. People who say that to you are liars. That's not what I mean. Think about it. Jesus' disciples did not experience a life of ease. What he promised them is that in their life of difficulty, he would use all of it for good. Jesus told Peter, for example, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. Well, that doesn't sound fun. Satan has asked for permission to come into this pen and mess with you. Now, wouldn't you expect Jesus at this point to say, and I have forbidden it? No, that's not what he says. He says, but I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. As Satan afflicts you, I've prayed that you grow stronger through it. I'm not gonna keep you from pain or trial, Peter, but I promise to use it for good. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. If he withholds it, it isn't good. And if he allows it, he plans to use it for good. What if you went through life of that confidence that at the door of the sheep pen of your life lay an almighty, ever watchful, omnicompetent shepherd who would not let anything pass that he does not promise to use for good? I'm telling you, that would change how you approach any and every stressor in your life. Yes, people hurt us. People disappoint us. You are still gonna fail at certain things, but none of that would ever overwhelm you because in all those things, you'd be more than a conqueror because it would mean that this setback and this tragedy and this frustration and this broken heart and that difficulty with my spouse and this difficulty with my kids, this illness, all of it is allowed by an ever watchful shepherd who has already proven his commitment to me by laying down his life for me and promises now to use it for good. I know it may not feel like that right now. And you may feel like, why'd he let this into the pen of my life? I'm just telling you, he's gonna use it for good because he has proven his commitment to you when he laid down his life for you. 
Finally, number five. We have in this claim to be the door, we have in this passage where he explains that we have an offer of abundance. I'm the door, Jesus says. If anybody enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. We'll go in and out, that's freedom, right? In and out, you know, go whenever you want, do whatever you want. Find pasture, that's abundance. Jesus expands on what he means by the abundance part of the next verse, which we're not gonna fully cover this week. It'll be for the later message, John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it more abundantly. The Greek word for abundance there is parisos. It means over the top. Follow me and you're gonna have an over the top life. Let me speak plainly to you. I know that for many of you listening to me right now, particularly let's talk to high school and college students. All of you, but let me zero in on you for a minute. Surrendering to Jesus doesn't feel like the path to freedom and abundance. You're like, surrender to Jesus? That means giving up all my fun. Surrender my freedom, my ability to choose what I wanna do with my body, my ability to choose what I wanna do in my relationships, with my career dreams, with my money. You are terrified to give up control of your life because you think it will lead you to a life of misery. But friend, it's freedom. And you can trust him because Jesus is a shepherd who created you. His pasture lands are the life you were created for. You know, C.S. Lewis had the best analogy for this. He asked the question, when is a fish most free? When is a fish the freest? You don't set a fish free by taking it out of the water and putting it up on the land, up where the people are, up where they run, up where they walk, up where they play all day in the sun. Wandering free, wish I could be part of that world. That makes for a catchy song and a questionable kids movie. But in reality, but in reality, that would kill the fish. A fish is freest when it is swimming in the habitat it was designed for. You were created for Jesus, by his design, for his love, to thrive under his rule. Friend, that means... That means you will always feel incomplete, unsatisfied, uneasy, off. Just something's off until you're in right relationship with him. And until he lays in front of the pen of your life, you will be subjects to thieves and robbers who only want to kill, steal, and destroy you. All oh, those thieves and robbers, they'll offer you satisfaction. That's part of the deal. Come with me. I got what you're looking for. It's over here, over here in this career or it's over here in this relationship, but it never is, never. They will entertain you and tantalize you for a while, but thieves and robbers only lead to greater brokenness and more emptiness. Some of you are there now. Y'all listen to this, New York Times reporter, Nicholas Kristof, who's written for years on the global injustice of, of human trafficking. Once attempted, this is 2004, to purchase the freedom of two Cambodian prostitutes that he had discovered in the process of investigation. After a lot of investigation, he concluded that the only practical way that he could get these ladies out, these particular ones out immediately was to buy their freedom. Both had been taken into the trade against their will. And maybe you say, well, I'm not sure that was the best way. Maybe not, but in the moment, he felt like this was the only sure way to get these two out. For the first of the two, he said it was a rather simple transaction. He paid $150 to the brothel owner to set this girl free. But when he tried to pay the price for the second girl named Shrey Moom, the owner had figured out she was dealing with a guy with resources, and so she demanded more money. Finally, after haggling, and the owner agreed to $203 as the price for Shrey Moom's freedom. But then, Nicholas Kristoff said, Shrey Moom told him, that she had pawned her cell phone and needed $55 to get it back. Forget about your cell phone, he said. We gotta get out of here. This is a dangerous place. See, he knew that when the local crime bosses found out what was going on, they would try to stop it. He said, we gotta leave now. This is, this is we're very, we gotta go now. We got time for nothing else. But Shrey Mom started crying and refused to leave. He told her that he said, basically you're going to choose between your cell phone and your freedom. She ran back, he said, to her tiny room in that brothel and locked the door. 
Even the brothel owner said to her, you better grab this chance while you can. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. But Shremon, hysterical now, refused. She only relented when Kristoff agreed to buy back her cell phone too. Then she asked for her pawned jewelry to be part of the deal. Kristoff explained, so we went back to get the phone and the jewelry, which were, I think, never her real concern. Shreemom later explained that her resistance had nothing to do with wanting the telephone and everything to do with last minute fear about whether her family and her village would accept her if she returned. The possibility of rejection by her mother was almost as frightening as the idea of finishing her life in the brothel. Good news is her family did receive her joyfully. They'd assumed she was dead and they shrieked and they hugged and they cried and it was this incredible reunion. But one year later, Christoph reported 2005, he was devastated to find that she was back in the brothel where she was being pimped out and regularly financially cheated by her owner. Christoph said it was a combination on her part of a desire for drugs, a way to pay off new debts she'd incurred and a way for self-esteem. Prostitutes, he says, are often so shattered and stigmatized that sometimes they feel like the only place they can hold their head high is in the brothel. It's heartbreaking. Obviously, that industry is one of the cruelest and most unjust practices ever inflicted by humans on one another, and we should all be working to end it. But I share this tragic story because it shows us that this broken world damages us. This broken world filled with thieves and robbers. And that damage comes to us both through our sin and the sin that others inflict upon us. And that damage creates in us a fear that will keep you in bondage to sin. Fear and shame keep you from perceiving the goodness of what's being offered to you and makes you susceptible to the thieves and robbers and keeps you hiding in your captivity from the one relationship that actually could lead you to life, to freedom, and to pasture. But friend, here in John 10, here in John 10, we got Jesus, the door. A good shepherd who lays himself down at the entryway of our lives to protect us from anything that could harm us if only we would trust him. The shepherd put himself not just between us and the thieves and the wild animals seeking to harm us, he put himself between us and the rightful consequences of our sin, you see. After we voluntarily sold ourselves to sin and sin and death had a rightful claim upon us, he stood between us and sin and death and said, to get to them, you gotta go through me and he took sin and death in our place. He stood between us and the rightful consequences of sin and death, and he absorbed those consequences into his own body. And when he did, something amazing happened. That curtain blocking the way into the Holy of Holies was torn in two, symbolizing that Jesus's torn body was now the door back into the presence of God, the door back into the Garden of Eden, back into the pasture lands where sin and death and curse and judgment and abandonment and chaos could not touch us anymore. There is therefore no condemnation, he said, or abandonment or fear or curse or shame or chaos. None of that for those who are in Christ Jesus in Christ Jesus, inside Christ Jesus, safe behind the walls of Christ Jesus. I'm the door, I'm the door. If anybody enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Friend, this is an offer for you. Listen, this is the life that you were created for. The pasture lands of God's goodness and grace are what your soul craves, the assurance that, yea, though you walk through the valley of shadow of death, you will not have to fear evil because thou art with me, because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. This is what awaits you on the other side of that door. But you gotta choose to go through it. David Jeremiah tells the story of how the great Houdini, regarded in his day as the world's greatest escape artist, had proven able to be able to get himself out of any confinement, handcuffs, straight jacket, locked caskets, sealed up prison cells. Could do any, anything you bound him in, he could be out in less than a minute. There was only one recorded instance where the great Houdini failed to escape. 
you know this? He was touring the British Isles and in a small town, he was invited to escape from the local jail. He said the cell door looked so ordinary, he thought it was a joke. He's like, I'll be out of here in 30 seconds. But after two hours of trying unsuccessfully to pick the lock, he gave up. And finally, in exhaustion and exasperation, he leaned against the door, conceding failure. And when he did that, to his surprise, the door just creaked open. It hadn't been locked to begin with. How many of us stay in prison behind an unlocked door? Jesus' blood has unlocked the door to your freedom. All you gotta do is lean on him. Dr. Jeremiah said that one of our enemy's greatest deceptions is convincing us that like Houdini, we gotta work and strive to unlock the door of our salvation, to pick the lock by earning God's love through good works. But see, all you gotta do is lean on Jesus and the door will open. Salvation, you see, is not what you do. It's not what you do to save yourself. It's receiving what God has already done to save you. Salvation is not about trying. It's about trusting. It's not about striving. It's about leaning. You wanna do that today? You wanna walk through that door today? You can do it today. Are you ready? There's pasture, there's safety, there's presence. It's all right through that door. Why don't you bow your heads at all of our campuses if you would. If you've never received Jesus as Savior, or you're not sure that you have and you want to, then right now, you can say something to him like this, Lord Jesus, I wanna be inside your pastures of safety. I wanna go in there. I receive you as my Savior. I believe you died for me. Say it to him from your heart. You can use these words. I receive you as my Savior. I believe you died for me. And I surrender to you as my Lord. I'll follow you. I'll follow you. If you prayed that right now, I have one request. I need you to tell the person that invited you today or at the end of the service, our pastors and our prayer teams will be down here and I want you to come and tell one of them. This is a great life that he offers you, but you gotta choose to step boldly into it. Father, you promised your word would not return void. You are the door. We enter you. We're saved. We go in and out and find pasture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.